So this week we're happy to have Leo De Josia of Rice University and he'll be telling us about the asymptotic operator. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the first three talks we were working on um, gluing a flow, a Morse flow line to itself. So we're kind of changing the game up today. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've broken kind of the, the day into three pieces. Um, I, I like to kind of describe an analogy that probably a lot of people are, are comfortable with. Oh, this happens sometimes. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so there's an analogy that I like to remind everybody of, and it's an analogy between um, Morse theory and uh, symplectic field theory. And in that analogy, <clears throat> you get to kind of see that the asymptotic operator plays the role of the Hessian. So that's kind of nice. Um, and also it's a nice tie in into the, the past three weeks when we've been working with Morse theory. So that's good. Um, then we'll talk about the, the operator, the construction, and it's um, some of its properties. And then hopefully if there's time, we can work out some examples on the irrational ellipsoid where things are pretty nice. Okay. And then if I say anything wrong, please let me know. It's, I have much to learn if I say something incorrect. That's the best way for me to learn. So um, before I get started, I'll just, I'll try to tell some notation that I hope to stick to. Um, okay, so I'll use T for an S1 coordinate. And then I'll use the, the convention that that's uh, R mod Z. And then sometimes I might even use that row from R to S1 is the projection. And then um, I'll use S for a real coordinate. And then oftentimes <clears throat> I'll have alpha to map from S1 into a contact manifold, a ray orbit. But if you notice by the conventions that I've chosen, that means that uh, V D phi T D of alpha zero, I think, where T is the period of uh, of alpha. Okay. So yeah, I think it's it's good to get that started. I think there's there are times when it'll be actually important if I use real coordinate versus a versus a S1 coordinate. Okay. So then we can get started. Um, so I'll kind of make a little table. I, I thought the story was kind of nice. Uh, let's talk about this analogy that I was mentioning. So let's talk about this analogy. Morse theory uh, as to symplectic field theory. Okay. All right. So um, for lots of the, for basically this table I'm about to make, uh, I, I used uh, Chris Wendell's notes, uh, symplectic, uh, lectures on symplectic field theory a lot. This is chapter three, but I got most of it from there. But um, let me try to summarize this story. So on the left, we had uh, X was a Morse flow line. It was a Morse flow line uh, joining critical points P plus to P minus. Okay, that's something that we had. And then on, in symplectic field theory, sort of the analogous object, well, you can look at, um, <clears throat> you can look at uh, crazy Riemann surfaces, but let's just stick to a, just stick to a cylinder for a second. Um, we'll have a pseudo-holomorphic cylinder in a completed symplectic, uh, symplectic cobordism. Okay. And it might join, this joins Rabe orbits, let's say alpha minus to alpha plus. And I'm going to highlight something for a second. This isn't just, I've, I've chosen this notation. I've chosen that the Morse theory is going to go from a P plus to a P minus, whereas my Ray orbits going my yeah my 
curve is going to go from gamma minus to a gamma plus. And I, the reason why is that I've, I've read and it seems like Morse theory and um, uh, Fleur theories are often like a negative gradient flow. And then symplectic field theory tends to match a more positive gradient flow. This is just something that I've read. So I can't tell you how crazy that drives me. But yes, that's true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was very interesting. Okay. So I, I just chose I just chose the notation to match that kind of fact. Um, so to continue this analogy, on the left I have a section. So um, I'm going to describe a section of the tangent bundle of the tangent bundle of M. And so at a point, I'll give you the negative gradient at that point. Um, and this is a section on my manifold, <clears throat> which vanishes at the critical points. So I'm going to say this section vanishes at the critical points. OK. And then on the other side of things, I can also describe a section, but it's but it's of a very big bundle, and it's kind of I think this is right. I don't want to write the tangent space of the loop space because that would be wrong in some sense because there's a there's a degeneracy in the ray orbits, but I'll describe a section of this bundle where at a loop gamma, I will give you negative j, you project to the contact distribution and the what vector, it's the gamma, it's the time derivative. Okay, so this is a section, this is an element of the sections of the pullback contact bundle. Um, okay, there's a j on the contact distribution, okay. I didn't say that, um, but the, the neat thing is that this is a section that also vanishes precisely at the critical points. Sorry, not the critical points, the, um, the, the rape orbits. Okay. Okay. This table is going to get longer. Sorry, and you said pi pi is the projection to the contact distribution. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, a pi is a is the bundle map. It's a no, no, no. That's not what I want. It'll be it'll be the tangent bundle of M uh, projects to. Yeah, this is what I want. Okay. That's the picture. Oh, it's going slowly. Yeah, it's uh, it's my bundle over the contact manifold. Okay. Okay. I'll put that away and then um, let's think. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is so I have these sections that vanish at my nice spots. So I'm I'm you can actually linearize your sections at these at these zeros. So if you linearize your your section on the left at a critical point, so linearizing above section at a critical point P, this actually gives you the Hessian. This provides your Hessian, which is a linear map from the tangent space to itself. Okay. And then, yeah, that's right. Okay. And you'll be able to do the same thing if you linearize the other section that I described for you, this, this thing right here, um, we'll, get, we'll get a linear operator on sections. So this is, this is where the asymptotic operator comes in. So at each rabe orbit alpha, <clears throat> linearizing the above, provides a linear from the sections of the pullback bundle to itself. Okay. All right, and that's, that is the asymptotic operator right there. And that's where 
that's where the uh, sort of fits into this analogy. That's the cool spot. And then I, I can say one more thing to continue this, that if you have, if your Morse function is non-degenerate, for example, uh, that translates into the fact that your Hessians are everywhere, or each of your Hessians is a non-degenerate linear operator. And the same thing kind of holds for the, for your contact form, but let me write this down. So uh, F non-degenerate implies H non-degenerate for all P. And so over here, if your lambda, this is a if and only if, your lambda is non-degenerate contact form, if and only if, you know, I didn't give it a name. That was silly of me. Let me give this a name. I'm gonna call this L sub alpha. Okay. Okay. So uh, your contact your contact form is not a non-degenerate one if and only if your your asymptotic operators are like none of them have a kernel. So all have non-trivial have trivial. Kernel. Okay. All right. Um, and you can even say more things like on the left hand side, if you look at your Morse flow line, you can look at the index of that Morse flow line, and that has a lot to do with the with the spectra of the Hessians at the two spots. And then likewise on the on the right hand side of things, um, <clears throat> the index of your pseudo-holomorphic curve. U um, has a lot to do with the spectra of the asymptotic operators. So that was that was me kind of just giving a bird's eye view of how this fits into this big story. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but can I ask a question? Yeah, please, please. Um, I'm a little. It looks like your section vanishes at any like i could just take an arbitrary reparameterization of a ray board but like it goes fast in some spots slow in some other spots yeah I, just, I don't know it's not really a question but no no that, that there's there's a detail there there's like a built-in degeneracy so uh what do i want um uh, i'm that that fact might be wrong I, that might it certainly it will vanish at a ray orbit, but maybe not at all of them. Maybe that like maybe that vanishes at more spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, certainly you have to kind of deal with things. The fact that, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. I, I'm okay. confused. Which fact you're saying might be wrong? Is is uh? I don't know if I need to like amp this up anyway, or maybe change my base space to make sure that that will only vanish uh, at a ray orbit. Um, the the J pi psi gamma dot, you mean? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, the way I understand what's happening here, there's, um, there's a functional in the background that, that you didn't write down, but that, that plays the role of the Morse function. Uh, which you define just by integrating the contact form over loops. And critical points of that functional are the, uh, they're basically all parameterizations of closed ray orbits. Uh, and, and the parameterization can be as crazy as you want. So it's, it's, it's an incredibly degenerate functional. It's invariant under the action of the diffeomorphism group of the circle, mm. right? Um, so the fact that you're only linearizing, so you, I mean, you've, you've written down basically the gradient of that functional and the fact that you're then only linearizing that in directions of the contact planes, which are normal to the orbits, uh, allows you to ignore that degeneracy. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We, yeah, we wouldn't let a section go in the rave direction. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this does vanish. All right, cool. All right, so I can actually go in to, to describe, and that con yeah, that fun that functional that you were describing that's up here. This is like the it's uh, you think this is wrong. It's going to be I can do it over here. 
uh, gamma is going to go to the pullback of the contact distribution. That's the, right. That's the action functional, right. Okay, so let's start talking about how to build this thing. It's kind of nice. Um, oh, I, I mentioned, I might mention that there's probably a lot of different reasons why we'll call it, an, people call it an asymptotic operator. But I, I gather one way is that if you have a, if you do have a pseudo holomorphic curve from a punctured Riemann surface, like into a, a completed symplectic cabordism or something like that, um, <clears throat> then you have a Cauchy Riemann type operator on that bundle on the pullback bundle. And that operator in a very specific sense approaches the asymptotic operators that you'll find at each rave orbit. So there's a lot of asymptotic approx uh, approaching these asymptotic operators. I'll say that word a lot today. Okay. Um, so let's construct uh, the operator. So the first thing that I'll want to do is just, just describe the, the symplectic connection on Hermitian bundles over circles. So let me describe, let's say, I'm gonna let alpha, um, this is going to be a, con, a, a ray orbit. And then, so what you have, this provides, a Hermitian vector bundle, which is the pullback bundle, take that J, and then you look at your contact, your uh, symplectic form on the bundle. I might call that W sometimes, but that's, that's a Hermitian vector bundle over S1. And that's where we're going to be. That's, that's the bundle for whose sections we will be operating on. So, um, I'm going to describe a connection on this bundle. And to do that, I'll first explain what the parallel transports are. So a, if you, a system of parallel transports will be given by the following. So if I have, I'll have, let's say, okay, I'll just write this in words. So linear, you know, parallel transports. on E, I'll call that E. So I'll, if you give me two fibers, which is see the contact distribution at alpha of S, no, alpha of T, to the contact distribution at alpha of say T plus S. So I'm really letting my S be a real parameter and my T is a S1 parameter. Um, which I can I can add them. That makes sense. This is going to be the the linearized ray flow, and I got to make sure I get this right. So this is going to be T S, I think. Okay. And this is a parallel transport along the curve uh, row. Oh, is my is it slowing down? Okay, that might be too bad. So this is a this describes. Um, a parallel transport along the curve row. Okay. And then if you have, if you ever given a, like a system of parallel transports on a vector bundle, this gives you uh, a, a connection. So this is going to hand us a connection. Uh, it's a, what words do I want to say? I'll just say this gives us it's a symplectic connection. And I think a lot of people use NABLA with a capital R, I think, for the ray orbit. But this is a this is a connection on my Hermitian our Hermitian vector bundle. And um, it, when I say it's symplectic, I mean that if you apply it to your symplectic form, this is zero, kind of like in the same way that the uh, Levi-Civita connection, when you apply the 
that connection to the to the metric, you'll get zero. Kind of the same thing. Okay. Um, but this is some. I remember studying this like a year ago and being really stuck. Uh, I knew this had something to do. This connection was going to have something to do with the with the family of matrices um, that you get described. This is too bad. Okay. Okay. People might need to see that for a minute. Um, but I'm going to say what happens when we get a unitary trivialization. So we're gonna I'm gonna take a unitary trivialization of this Hermitian vector bundle, and it's gonna hand us a whole bunch of things. So I'll go to this next page now. So I'm gonna let tau from s1 to the contact bundle be a unitary trivialization okay so we're going to see all the things that this gives us um well the first thing we get we get the christoffel symbols so well even before that we get a unitary framing these are sections A to I from S1 to the contact bundle, the contact, sorry, to the Hermitian vector bundle. And um, uh, okay, so now that we have this framing, we can describe uh, the Christoffel symbols with respect to this framing. So this provides, um, I think for all indices, we've got gamma ij, these are functions from S to R, and these satisfy um, if you take your symplectic connection, you do a covariant derivative along your along the S1, and you apply it to one of your standard frames, say A to I. This is going to look like A to I J, sorry, gamma I J, A to I. Okay, that's really nice. So that's that's something that we get, and I'm I'm going to construct out of this a two n by two n family of matrices. So from this, I'm just going to let uh, gamma of let's see t be the two n by two n matrix. Sorry, A to, A to J, no, on, on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, and I, J, that's a J. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know my my J is look kind of weird. So from this, okay, and so the the rth row is gonna the row is gonna be on top, the column is gonna be on bottom. So it's rth row seeth column is gamma. Probably don't need to go into so much detail, but is a this thing, okay? But essentially, there's a really nice way that you can write this family of of matrices gamma in terms of the family of matrices which describes the linearized Rabe flow with respect to this trivialization, and that's something that 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 I was stuck on for a very long time, and now I'm happy I can talk about it. So. Do people have any, any questions before I move on? I haven't even described the asymptotic operator yet, but, we're, but we're, I promise we're getting there. Um, okay, so I'm going to let M of S be the uh, symplectic matrix uh, for S in R describing the linearized rate flow. So this describes... Uh, D, let's think, get this right, with respect to my framings at each point. And it, this is something that also messed me up for a while. It's very important, well, depending on how you see things, but I think it's very important to make sure that we're using a real coordinate for, for the input. You don't want to put a time input in there. You don't want to write M of T, because that would give you a periodic family of matrices 
And then by the time you get back to one, uh, you've, you have the identity matrix. And that would show that your linearized return map is one, is, is the identity matrix, so that's super degenerate. So you really do want that to be a real coordinate, and you don't want that M to be periodic. That's something to keep in mind. Um, but the cool thing is that you can, you can write the following matrix equation. You can write gamma of T actually equals negative, take the derivative of uh, your family of matrices M. I'll explain what I mean here. Inverse of S, where rho of S is T. So I'm gonna explain what this is down here. Essentially, down here, this is giving you a way to describe the symplectic connection. Um, it's Christoffel symbols, essentially. I mean, if you know the Christoffel symbols, you know the, you know the connection. Um, and so this down here is saying, hey, if you know what the linearized rave flow looks like, if you can have that matrix in your trivialization, then you have your Christoffel symbols, and the connection isn't so scary to deal with. Um, and so if, you, if you're like me and you're struggling to prove something like this, if you want to, uh, to try to prove this on your own, what you would do is you would take a, a section, you'd kind of build a section along a curve, and that you construct it so that it is parallel. So basically, pick a vector at a point, and then to, to get vec more vectors, just flow it according to the rate flow. So then you can write that section in terms of the M and the Eta's and taking the, taking the symplectic connection, applying the Leibniz rule using Christoffel symbols, this equation kind of falls out, but it's not too exciting to watch somebody do it, but, but this will, we'll probably use this a lot. So I'll put this down here. Sorry, but, but just a question. Gamma is periodic, right? Gam yes, gamma is periodic. That's definitely true, yeah. Gamma is periodic because the the individual Christoffel symbols are maps from the ma the base manifold. That's right. Yeah. But that's but that's kind of not clear from that expression. From down, yeah. Sorry. It's I, I. Right here, I wrote where basically S is any lift of T. So yeah, that's a good point. On one hand, the thing on the the thing on the right. This also took me a while to figure out, but the thing on the right doesn't, it's like, it's like the Riemannian curvature tensor is, comp is made of non-tensorial things, but the whole thing is tensorial. It's, the situation is very similar here. This is a family of matrices that's made out of pieces that are not individually periodic, but the whole thing, it turns out to be periodic. And um, yeah, that's, that's good. That, that's something that messed me up for a while. Actually, those so those matrices. Uh, I mean, you can you can deduce f due to where they come from that those matrices satisfy a condition which is not the same as periodicity, but makes the left hand side periodic. It's something like uh, m of s plus one equals m of s times m of one. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It's not all. Uh, it's not always the case that m of m of a plus b this is not always m of a times m of b but it certainly is the case that m of a plus one is m of a times m of one and that's how you would prove something like that that's right yeah okay just undo that okay does anybody need me to go back to the previous screen maybe not okay. all right so uh we have basically have everything we need belabor this too much. Oh, I should also mention one last thing. Uh, if you define if you define S of T to be the S1 family of matrices uh, J naught times uh, gamma of T, I'll just remind this is the Christoffel symbols. And I'll even write this out as a, because I don't have it but it's, it's negative J naught M dot of S M inverse of S, then you can argue that, that this is a family of symmetric matrices. Um, yeah, okay. 
So I'll write that. This is then S of T is symmetric for all T in S1. Okay. All right. So I let me describe what the, uh, what the operator is now because uh, I can. So define uh, L alpha, which is a map from your sections of your bundle to itself at first. We'll complete it in a second. Uh, but if you give me a section, this will map to negative J naught times the you take the covariant derivative with respect to your connection, this thing right here. So this is L alpha of eta. And it doesn't come out of no, it doesn't come from nowhere. Like we mentioned earlier, um, this really does come from linearizing, a, like linearizing an L2 like gradient equation coming from the contact action functional. So this really is kind of like a Hessian in some way. It doesn't come from nowhere. This is a Hessian of um, the A lambda, or this is that contact uh, action functional that I described previously. Okay, this is the asymptotic operator. But really, if you want to ever prove anything about the asymptotic operator, it's pretty nice to know what it looks like in, in coordinates. So I'll save a page and I'll make this smaller. But in, in your trivialization, you know that a smooth section just looks like a, just like the following. Okay. So, can, I, can I insert a remark before it disappears from the page? Yeah. yeah I think yeah. Pe people should be aware so that they're not tremendously shocked someday that in Fleur homology, that minus sign isn't there in front of the asymptotic operator because of the fact you mentioned earlier that that it's it's a it's negative gradient flow versus positive gradient flow. Okay. Yeah, it's it's like you have no. Is it like you basically have no way to fight it? Like you have to have the negative if you want to use your contact action functional, and then come up with your L2 gradient of it and then linearize, right? I mean, right. Where, where, where is the spot where you can't really budge? Is that I mean, what I just described? I mean, the, the fundamental principles here are the, the asymptotic operator should be the Hessian of whatever functional you're, you're interested in. Okay. And if you, if you use this to define something like the Conley-Zehnder index, then that's supposed to play the role of a relative Morse index of that functional. This has the unfortunate consequence that conley zehnder indices in the Fleur homology literature differ from the SFT literature by a sign. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a fact that I'll bring up that I, I'll bring up later about the eigenvalues of this thing. And in some sources, the eigenvalues are flipped and sometimes they're not flipped. So I'll be careful with what I mean when, it comes, when I get there. Can I okay. ask you a question about that comment? Yeah. Is, isn't it also in like Fleur homology or symplectic homology, like the negative Rabe orbits or the Hamiltonian orbits or something similar? Or is that related to this? I think that that kind of depends exactly which kind of Hamiltonian you're looking at. Depends what you want to do. That can sometimes be true. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll just write this really quickly. So. In a, in a unitary trivialization, we know that the sections look like, so it's a, okay, given tau, oh, I have to do it again, I'm sorry, everybody. What's going on, okay. Um, so given a unitary trivialization, your sections look like um, this, these smooth maps to R2n which commute with the J's and all these nice things. Um, but you can actually ask, what does this operator look like in a trivialization? So in this trivialization, so here, L alpha takes the following form. So if you give me a, a map from S1 to R2n with coordinates, <clears throat> it will produce negative 
you'll, ap you'll apply the matrix onto the derivative of t of eta, and then you will whip out that nice matrix that we cooked up. So this is the, I'll write it again what this is, but this right here is basically what you get from j nodding the Christoffel symbols, and this is symmetric. So this is symmetric. Okay. And so really having this formula is you can get you can get a lot done. Or if, for example, if you wanted to show that this operator is a symmetric operator on the um, on the sections, I guess you could probably do it a fancy way using that it's like a symplectic operator, but just doing it in coordinates is a really nice way to prove it. So this is a symmetric operator. Uh, it's kind of getting messy, but I'll write this basically. L alpha eta one eta two equals eta one L alpha eta two. Ah, okay. And so uh, there's some, there are some other nice properties of this thing. I'll talk a lot about it right now. Um, I'll move to the next page. That's okay. So you can extend, as always, let's extend the domain and range so that L alpha is now a map of Sobolev spaces. So it goes from uh, one, two, so this is one derivative in L2 of the sections. And it's a first degree, a first degree operator. So take down a derivative and go to L, L2 of alpha bundle. Okay. And sometimes you might see this as written as H1, or sometimes you might see this written as L upper two, Lower one. Okay. Okay. Nope. <laughs> okay. And then, so you could ask is this thing a continuous, like is this even a bounded linear operator now that you've extended it to Bonnock spaces? Yes, it is, a, it is continuous. And not only is it continuous, but it's Fredholm. Not only is it Fredholm, it's Fredholm of index zero. So uh, L alpha is Fredholm of index zero. So if you're interested in why it might be that, I think it's worth talking about. Remember that in coordinates, it looks like eta goes to negative J naught eta dot plus uh, minus S of T eta. Okay, I'm just gonna isolate it into two pieces with using colors. So if you look at this first piece, technically this is this operator is formed by a composition. It's a composition by including W12 into L2 and then composing it by slapping, an, slapping the matrix S onto it. So the first thing is a compact operator because S1 is compact, I think. Um, but that's a compact operator, so composing it with any other Bonnock space um, map is going to give you a compact operator. So if you could argue that the that the blue piece is uh, Fred home of index zero, then you'd be done because adding a compact operator doesn't change that. So then you can look at the map that just sends eta to its derivative, its weak derivative. Um, this is Fred home of index zero. You can actually compute like the the kernel and the co-kernel are both uh, two n-dimensional, so it's kind of nice. But either way, we have our we have a Fred home operator. This is very nice. Sorry, can I ask? I'm I'm just a little bit confused. Can you recall what L alpha is again? Uh, the definition oh, of L alpha. Alpha is, alpha is my Ray orbit. And and L is the asymptotic operator. L is, yeah, L is the asymptotic operator that I've, that I've constructed from my alpha. So, so shouldn't this have infinite dimensional kernel and co-kernel? I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Um, no, infinite dimensional kernel. It's, because you were saying this is the analog of the Hessian. Mm -hmm. in this, in this setting. What I you're mean, thinking of is how many eigenvalues it has. That's a different question. Yeah, the eigenspace for zero is it might be trivial, but you have all uh, of them. Yeah. In in fact, I 
let, that leads me at my next topic is the 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 spectrum. So the the spectrum of this operator is really nice. Um, I'll I'll write this down. Okay. So the spectrum of. Uh, before you move yeah. on, could yeah. you just repeat which part was uh, compact and which part was Fred home? I yes. Just yeah, I should have. I should have. Okay. So this right here. So this right here is um, W12 into L2. This right here is compact. And then, and then applying the S, it, it remains compact. So the whole pink thing is compact. And then um, this over here, this right here is Fred Holm of index zero. And I know there's a negative J naught there, but that's not so important. It's really important to see that eta mapping to its weak derivative is Fred Holm of index zero. So those are the two pieces. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the fact that the operator is symmetric tells us that the eigenvalues will all, well, the, the spectrum will be totally real. So let me write some facts about the spectrum. So the spectrum of L alpha, it's a, it's a discrete subset of R. It contains, it's entirely eigenvalues. And the really nice thing is that um, each eigenvalue has finite multiplicity. So it's just really nice all around. So each eigenvalue has finite multiplicity. So the nice thing about it being a discrete subset of R, for example, is like if you, if you have an asymptotic operator, and let's say you know that you have zero in the kernel, um, you know you have a, a degenerate operator, then you can, you know you can add a little bit, you can add a teeny tiny number for which you can bump zero away from you, and then you'll have a, a, a non-degenerate operator. And you know this new thing won't have zero in its, in its spectrum because the spectrum's discrete. So that's, an, that's a nice fact that you can use quite a lot. Um, uh, let's think. What else? I see, but, but sorry, going back to my previous confusion, there's infinitely many eigenvalues, both positive and negative in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yes, yes, yes. The eigenvalues, you've got tons of them. And I think they go off to infinity both ways. I think that's a fact. Um, but, but the nice thing is that each, you, you, fix an, you fix an eigenvalue that has finite multiplicity. And I'm pretty sure that when you're in the contact, when you're in the three-dimensional case, I think every eigenspace is either dimension one or two. I think that's true. Yeah, I think I think you can use winding numbers to prove that. Um, so let's just see it. Okay, so actually that lead that lets me go into winding numbers. So let me talk about winding numbers for a second. So the did you did you say at the beginning that your contact manifold is three dimensional? No, 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 no. It's uh, it's okay. Then then you just said something that's wrong. Oh, oh. Well, uh, you can have, because the winding numbers don't give you anything if you're in higher dimensions. So. Right, right. But, but for, three, for three dimensions, that's true. Is that the case? For three dimensions, that's true. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, there is, I mean, in general, I think there, there, there is, um, yeah, there is an upper bound. Uh, it's, you don't have to use winding numbers. There is an upper bound on the, the, the possible dimension of an eigenspace which depends on the dimension of the ambient manifold. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. It gets larger with the manifold. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, let me think what I was gonna say. Um, yeah, so we can talk about winding numbers and these are, they're really pretty. So let's, let's take an, eigen, like an eigenfunction. So let eta w12 be an eigenfunction of the asymptotic operator. So that's L alpha of eta <clears throat> is alpha is, uh, is gonna be some 
mu eta. I almost use I almost use lambda, but Joe taught me never to use only for contact, only for the contact form. Okay, uh, okay. So what was I saying? Okay, so if you actually kind of write out what this equation looks like, um, you can write the the first. You can write the derivative. You can write the weak derivative in terms of stuff in in W12. So basically you just amp up the regularity and you get to say that all you get to say that all eigenfunctions are I did I say C infinity. Uh, let, let me actually write this out. If I kind of this gives me I want to get this right. Um, eta dot equals J naught times Ada uh, mu eta minus plus so plus j naught eta. Here's a way you can actually write out what that equation gives you. Um, you can actually see on the left, you see its first derivative in LP, but the thing on the right is in W12. So you think you've lost S somehow. No, oh, do I be there somewhere? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, let me just move all this to the side, and then, yeah. Okay, J naught of S times eta. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you can use like I, th I think you can do, um, like product rule because the other things are smooth. Okay, but. The point is all your eigenfunctions are actually smooth functions. And so this tells you that, in fact, um, uh, your eigenfunction eta is, is nowhere vanishing if and only if uh, eta is non-zero. Okay, and this is this is nice because if you have a non if you have a non-zero eigenfunction, this actually gives you in a trivialization what it gives you is um is the following map. So, oh uh, yes, and thank you, Chris. I'll, I'll write here n equals three. So uh, m is three-dimensional. So that the contact so that the contact planes are two-dimensional, and in this in a trivialization. Then your eigenfunctions eta are going to map S1 into um, not R2, but R2 without the origin. So if you compose that with a if you compose that with a retraction, then you've got you have a map from S1 to S1. And you can take the degree of this map, and this is called the winding number associated to that eigen eigenfunction. So um, the degree of eta from S1 to S1 is the is the winding number of eta, and there are some nice properties. So if you have two different if you have two different eigenfunctions of the same eigenvalue, they'll have the same winding number. And this is this is, I think, how you can prove that the eigenspaces are all of maximal dimension two, but that's not so important right now. Um, the, the main thing is that this gives a well-defined function from the spectrum of your eigenvalue, uh, of your asymptotic operator to Z. So, so um, this induces a map um, from the spectrum of your asymptotic operator to z um, because uh, let me see because eta one is the winding number of eta two for non zero eta one eta two eigenfunctions of same eigenvalue okay so you get a you get a, this map and the cool thing is that this map is surjective and 
Um, what else can you say about it? You can say if, if you use your convent, if you use our convention where you have the, our minus sign. So I used, I'll use it in red that L alpha is negative J naught nabla R. So I'm really using that negative right there. Then you can say that the asymptotic, that then this function is non decreasing. So it says non decreasing. So if you're looking at a source that uses a different uh, convention, if, if, if a source uses the plus, then this will be a non-increasing function. Okay. Mercifully, I'm not aware of anyone in Fleur homology ever having made use of this fact. That it's increasing or this fact? Yeah, yeah. So huh. that, it's, that it's monotone whichever way. So, so then we don't have to worry about whether it's increasing or decreasing. We can say it's increasing. <laughs> oh. Wait. Well, it, 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 it can be. You can have two I you can have two eigenvalues that are different that have the same winding number though, right? Non non strictly increasing, yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Cool. Um well this is this is great. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff on the asymptotic operator. I think I can I think I have enough time just to write some facts about some cute little computations on the irrational ellipsoid, unless there are any other questions. Okay, all right. Well, I'm just gonna write down, I'll throw out some facts at you all, and we can probably wrap up. So let's do nice computations on the irrational ellipsoid. Okay. So I'll just kind of throw some, throw some stuff up. So uh, E is, of course, E, A, B. I'll use the notation. I'll use the convention that this is the set of, uh, let's see, 2 pi times Z1 squared over A plus Z2 squared over B equals 1. OK, and then. Uh, the quotient is not rational. Okay, so this is a this is a convex hypersurface in C two, so it's it will inherit uh, contact structure and it inherits and it inherits. Um, let's think the it inherits the complex structure coming from the integrable contact complex structure on C two. Okay, so. You can actually write the Rabe flow of the of the bundle of the contact form as z1 z2 goes to e to the 2 pi i a nope 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 e to the 2 pi i s over a z1 is an a e to the 2 pi i s over b z2. Okay, and then, uh, uh, so great. We can get some Rabe orbits from this. I'll just kind of, I had two of them. So I had, I did this whole story for the, the Z equals zero plane and the Z two equals zero plane, but I'll just do one of them for now. So we can get alpha is a map from S1 to E, which sends T to uh, the Rabe flow A T, times root two pi, I don't know. See, it's, it's always so many little details with this little, okay. I just decided at one time, I was just gonna write it all down once and I would never have to write it down ever again. So that's what I'm using right now. <laughs> okay, so then um, you can take a unitary trivialization. Um, so trivialize the bundle over alpha by saying, T x y goes to x partial x two alpha of t plus y partial y two alpha of t. This provides a unitary trivialization of the bundle over the over alpha, and so that gives us all sorts of stuff. So I'll just write down what the what the family of matrices are that come from this, and then we can pretty much wrap up. So, so if you want to know the 
the uh, linearized rate flow, you'll get that the linearized rate flow is this nice cosine of s, cosine of s. So, no, 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 that's wrong. Uh, I'm going to use the notation. I like this notation. I'm going to write rot for rotation of uh, 2 pi b s over a. So that's, that's my uh, symplectic matrix, family of symplectic matrices. And then you can compute the matrix of the Christoffel symbols. And this turns out to be the following. The Christoffel symbols matrix, not only is it, in, is it periodic, but it actually just equals, uh, it's just a constant. So negative 2 pi a over b j naught. And so s of t is just 2 pi a over b identity matrix. OK. And then I'm kind of running out of time, but basically, we kind of have the whole spectrum here. So if you look at the spectrum, uh, OK, the spectrum is just going to be the following. I'll write it in, in, red, in red. So the spectrum of the asymptotic operator is 2 pi z minus a over b. And uh, that's the spectrum. Each, each eigenvalue has a two-dimensional eigenspace. And in fact, because this operator is of this form, it's actually a, a complex linear operator, which is nice. And then the winding numbers are, are nice. Anyway, I, I can talk about that more if people like, but um, also in Joe's notes that she sent out, I have all the computations there. So yeah, I think I'll wrap up there. They're not my notes, they're your notes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And I'll go ahead and pause or I'll stop.